John chapter 5. So in verse 1, John 5 reads, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew town Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, called, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first stepped there in the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole, whatsoever disease he had, and a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Just imagine having this, this condition for thirty eight years that you can't walk. Like, most of you haven't even been alive for half that long. Okay? Um, but there's this miracle that God made happen that when the angels came into, into the water, the first person that got in there uh, got healed. But um, when Jesus, in verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. So essentially, it was impossible for him to get into the water in time. Because even if all those people, the other people, got their turn, and, and it's only in a certain season that this happens, right? So let's say once a year, even let's say, let's say there was 40 people, or let's say it was 37 people, okay, originally when he first got there. Okay, and then all those other 37 people over those 38 years, it doesn't mean that he was there for 38 years, but let's say he was, that they, each one had gotten healed. Now it was history. Well, guess what? In those 38 years, there'd be other people that needed healing. So it was, it was like he was never going to get healed that way. And Jesus asked him, Wilt thou be made whole? Like, do you want to be healthy? Do you want to be complete? And he said, Well, he can't because he can't get down. Somebody gets in there before him. So he's, basically, it was impossible to do it himself. And the same way, I think partially it's a picture of salvation, that it's impossible um, to do salvation yourself, okay? Um, it's completely helpless in this regard, and Jesus asked him, what they made whole? Well, what did he need? He just needed Jesus to heal him. Jesus said unto him, rise, take up that bed, and walk. Now, if he didn't have faith that Jesus could do this, or at least a little bit of faith that he'd at least try it, he would have stayed sitting on him. What are you talking about? But no, what happened? And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. Okay, so this happened on the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is a Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. So the Jews are telling him, What are you doing carrying your bed? You're not supposed to do that on the Sabbath day. Okay? You're not supposed to carry, carry things on the Sabbath day. You're not supposed to do work. You're only supposed to kindle a fire on the Sabbath day. Um, so they're asking, boy, what are you doing? He said, well, the person that healed me, he said, you know, take up your bed and walk. And if somebody that did a miracle like that, why wouldn't you listen to him, right? And, and then they asked him, verse 12, what man is that which said ought to be take up thy bed and walk? He that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away and multitude being in that place. You know, it says, he that was healed wist not who it was, which means he didn't know. And isn't it interesting again that Low German is very similar to uh, English? When it says wist, that would be kind of like our word wist, right? Hey, this got me. He didn't know it. Wist and wist, you could kind of think of it as the same definition. He just didn't know it. He, he didn't know who it was because Jesus had already left, okay? And there's a multitude, like a big crowd. Afterward, Jesus finded him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him. 
because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Why did they want to kill him? Well, they were jealous of him. But guess what? If somebody broke the Sabbath, they were supposed to be killed. And they thought he was guilty of that. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Okay? So now, now they want to kill him even more badly. Because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but he had made himself equal with God. Now, they're making, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 12. So they're making a big deal about the Sabbath, right? And they're making this big deal. And yeah, in the Old Testament, they were told to keep the Sabbath day holy. You know, they weren't supposed to labor in it. They weren't supposed to let their master labor in it. Nobody was supposed to work, okay? But they're making such a big deal of it, they're, they're, they're not seeing any trees because the forest is in the way kind of thing. You know, they're, in Matthew 23, 24, it says, You blind guys, you strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. So keeping the Sabbath was such a small thing compared to having God in the flesh in front of them. They were trying to swallow a camel, or straining at a gnat, but in the meantime, they were swallowing a camel. camel. They were not swallowing the fly, but in the meantime, they are swallowing a whole camel. That's what that means. It's just ridiculous. They had the wrong idea. They had the wrong picture. And just imagine, these people are talking to God in the flesh and trying to correct Him. Just imagine all these people that did that, 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 that didn't wind up getting saved, okay? Especially the reprobates. It's just ridiculous when later they realize this was God and they, you know, like after they're dead, and they, they had tried to correct them. So the punishment for breaking the Sabbath was death. The death. So do we need to keep the Sabbath today? Jesus did. And actually John uh, 5.18, where we're just reading, it says, He broke the Sabbath. It says, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath. So Jesus broke the Sabbath. Did that mean he sinned? No. Was Jesus just some special exception, such exception because he was God? Is that why it was okay for him to break the Sabbath? Well, if you're there in Matthew 12, let's read another example of when the Pharisees get mad about uh, things they did on the Sabbath. Matthew 12, 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, like, look, behold, just be, look. Thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. You're not supposed to do that on the Sabbath day, they're telling you. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was in hunger, and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God, and he ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. He's pointing it up. Hey, you're missing the big picture. There's something greater than the temple here. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So what does that mean? Ye would not have condemned the guiltless. Well, they're, they're trying to condemn the disciples for working on the Sabbath. So if Jesus said the disciples were guiltless for working on the Sabbath day, that means it's no longer a requirement. Okay? They're blameless even though they did work on the Sabbath day because he says you would not have condemned the guiltless. He's saying the disciples are guiltless even though they're plucking ears of corn on the, the Sabbath day and they're walking through there. And there's another example about the Sabbath in the same chapter, verse 9. And when he was departed, thence he went to their synagogue. Behold, there was a man which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that which 
that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will you not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched forth, and was restored, full as like as the other. And the Pharisees went out and held the counsel against him, how they might destroy him. Okay, well, some people say, well, the disciples in the corn, well, they had to eat. So it was like a necessary thing. It was like an essential thing they had to do. And doing well, well, okay, you know, doing well, like being a nurse or a doctor, that's an exception, right? So some people say, well, only good things, necessary or essential services you're allowed to do on the Sabbath. Of course, they don't actually keep the seventh day. They keep the, the first day, right? Sunday. These people that think we still have to keep the, the Sabbath. But there's a, a parable passage, or a parallel passage in Mark 2. So I'm going to read from Mark 2, starting verse 23. So is it only essential things or healing type things or, or rescuing people or those are the only things that you can do on the Sabbath? Well, if you look at this parable passage, remember, he says um, in Matthew 12, 8, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So he's the boss of the Sabbath day. <laughs> Simplify it. He is in charge of the Sabbath day. Mark 2, 23. And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as he went to pluck the ears of corn. It's the same story. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not awful? And he said unto them, Have you never read what David did when he had eaten and was hungered, he and they that were with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest, and did eat the showbread which is not lawful to eat but for the priest, and gave also to them which were with him. Now, pay turn to verse 27. And he said unto them, <laughs> The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So they're getting it backwards. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also the Sabbath. It was the Sabbath was made for us. That's why God instituted the Sabbath. It was made for us, for people. Okay? So what does it mean? So we can have a rest one day a week? Well, that could be part of it. But turn to Exodus chapter 31. There, there could be part of it, but there's no record that I found anyway of anybody keeping the Sabbath before Moses. Okay? Moses is the one that was, was first talked about. And you know, in Adam and Eve, it doesn't talk about them keeping the Sabbath. Yes, God rested the seventh day, but it doesn't say that these people back then were resting the seventh day before the flood, or even after the flood, tell Moses. It doesn't say that. And if anybody finds anything where it does that, it comes up to me and let me know. So, there's another reason why God instituted the Sabbath. It was made for us. That's, that's what it was made for. It was made for us. Exodus 31, 12. We'll find out what the Sabbath, why it was made for us. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. For, because, it is a sign between me and you. That's why he created the Sabbath. For a sign between God and us. For it is a sign between me and you. Throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whomsoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. So there's that death penalty. Six days may work be done, but on the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation for a perpetual covenant. Here it goes again. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Remember that word, rested, okay? So it is a sign. Well, a sign for what? It says that right in the same verse, in verse 13. It is a sign between me and you. Why? 
that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. God is the one that makes you clean, makes you holy. It's a sign of salvation, is what the Sabbath is. Because when it comes to salvation, we don't do any part of the work. On the Sabbath day, we're, we're supposed to do absolutely no work. Why? Because it's a sign that we don't do any work when it comes to salvation. It's completely all Jesus Christ. It's all God. In Deuteronomy 5, where the Ten Commandments are listed, in verse 12, it says, Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy ox, nor thy ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. So yeah, rest is part of it. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thanks through a mighty hand and by stretched arm. Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Again, it was to remember something, okay? It was that God brought them out by a mighty hand. We get saved by a mighty hand. How, like how mighty? He sent his own son to die for us on the cross and to suffer in hell. That's how mighty. Jesus took our place. That's how mighty a hand God saved us by. You can turn to Hebrews 4 if, if you'd like. So it is a sign. It's a sign of salvation is what a Sabbath, what the Sabbath is. Okay? And the Pharisees, these Jews, were missing the picture. Okay? Man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. Not only for rest, but as a sign to, to learn about salvation. Hebrews 4.1 let us therefore fear, lest the promise being less left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So remember that word rested I, I told you about in that other passage, okay? So um, rested and rest is part of Sabbath, the Sabbath, okay? So let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So he's saying... Fear in case you're not going to be able to get into this rest. And what is this rest he's talking about? Well, let's keep reading. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, and then that heard. So some people might want to say to Hebrew 4 1. See, you got to watch out. You won't be able to get into to his rest. So that way you don't know. Well, no, it says. Only the ones that didn't have the faith mixed in. They're the ones that have to, have to worry about not, not being able to enter into his rest. Because verse 3, For when we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said. Okay, So if we believe, we get to enter into the rest. So he's just telling him, just make sure that you actually believe the right thing. That you believe the gospel. Otherwise, you're going to be coming short of entering into his rest. As he said, As I have sworn, sworn, sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, so he's quoting some scriptures. If they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Not because they were sinners. It doesn't say that. It says they entered not in because of unbelief. Okay? Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Okay, so if the rest was what Jesus did and came, like healed people and so on. If that was the rest that, that the scriptures were uh, foretelling, prophesying, then Jesus wouldn't have talked about another rest. Okay? He wouldn't have spoken about another day. 
There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. So there is a rest coming. There's a rest coming to us. There's a rest coming to the people that died in Christ before now. So there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, as any man fall. See, oh, look at that. Did you skip over it? Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. See, you've got to work for salvation. No! Look at the second part. Lest any man fall at the same example of unbelief. That's how you can not enter into that rest if you never believed in the first place. So, so uh, sa the Sabbath is a picture of salvation. Let's keep reading in John chapter 5. So that it keeps being brought up in this. The Pharisees keep straining at an out and swallowing the camel. Okay? It's like sometimes people that have glasses, they, they, they can't see where their glasses are because they're looking straight through them when they're looking, right? They, they don't realize. So I think I've probably done that a long time ago. I don't know. John 5, verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you. So we sang that song, Verily, verily. It says here, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also do the Son likewise. So notice he's saying, it wasn't just his, it wasn't his idea. He did what God the Father told him to do, okay? And what he saw the Father do. That's what, what he was doing. For the Father loved the Son, and showed him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that he may marvel. What does it mean to marvel? It means to wonder, like be amazed. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them. Quicken, so we don't use the word quick, quicken anymore. That, that means to be made alive, to quicken the dead, okay? And no Westerns, you quicken the, the dead. Well, there had a double connotation because if you were a quick way you're gone, you'd be dead. But quick means just alive. Because when you're dead, you're not so quick anymore. I guess maybe that's where it comes from. So it says here, though, in verse 21, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Okay? For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them. So really, you can see. The definition of quicken right in the same because the Father raises up the dead and quickens them. So he, he raises up the dead, he's quickening them. Okay? He's making them alive. Even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man that hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Okay, so God the Father has said okay, Jesus is responsible for that. That all men should honor the Son. We should honor Jesus Christ. Even as they honor the Father. Now pay attention to this. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. These Jews that pretended that they worship Jehovah God, worship God the Father, they, they didn't worship, they didn't honor God the Father because they didn't honor his Son. This is what that's saying. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. So if you despise the Son like the Jews do, then you despise the Father because the Father sent Jesus Christ. In 1 John 2.23, it is something similar. It says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. And, and these people that worship the Jews so much, they'll say, oh, the Jews, they just believe the Old Testament. No, they don't believe the Old Testament. They don't even believe the Torah. They don't even believe the first five books of the Bible. They don't believe any of it. Because if they don't have the Son, they don't have the Father. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Now, this is important because this helps you actually interpret the next verse in John 5.24 here. Verily, ver verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And I like, like this verse because this is what, one of the verses that really nailed it down for me that I cannot lose my salvation because it says it three different ways. Okay? You, you have everlasting life. Well, if you already have something that lasts forever, 
well, how could you ever not live then? How could you ever die? And shall not come into condemnation. So there's no way you'll be condemned. Condemned to what? To hell, right? But it's passed from death unto life. Your soul is already passed unto life. You're guaranteed to go to heaven. But this first part here might make you scratch your head a little bit. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. Okay? And remember, it said, he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. So if you hear his word, how do you hear his word? Do you just, does that mean whoever hears, hears his word gets saved? Because there's a lot of Pharisees and Jews that hear, heard Jesus' word and get saved. Well, there's a second part, right? You have to believe on him that sent me. So who's, who's him that sent Jesus? It was the Father. Well, don't you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ now shall be saved? Yes, okay? But what this is saying, if you believe on him that sent me, that means you actually believe that Jesus came from God, okay? If you believe on him that sent me, that means you're actually acknowledging that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, that he's the son of God. That's how if you hear Jesus' word, and, and believe it, right? And believe on him that sent me. That means you actually believe that Jesus Christ has come forth from God. You believe that? That Jesus Christ came from God and he came to pay for your sins. You have everlasting life. You will not come to condemnation if you're already passing death on the Verse 25. Verily, verily. See, verily, verily just means like truly, truly. Like it's a double uh, confirmation. It's like for sure. Like, um, guarantee. Like, it's, it's barely, barely. He's telling the truth. Barely, barely. Yes. And, of course, Jesus was always telling the truth. But he's trying to drive in how important this is. Barely, barely, I see unto you. The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Okay, so does that mean if he was preaching close to some gravestones, and... The sound waves travel to those dead bodies and they all of a sudden just rose up. No, it doesn't. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the spiritually dead. We were spiritually dead before we got saved. And we heard the voice of the Son of God. Well, how, how did you hear the voice of the Son of God? Jesus was already, you know, he already died, buried, and rose again before we were ever on the earth. How did we hear the voice of the Son of God? Through the Bible, through the gospel being preached to us. Jesus is, one of Jesus' names is the Word of God. So if we hear the Bible preach, we're hearing the voice of the Son of God. And if we hear, notice it says, and they that hear shall live. So hear means more than just hear. You actually hear and believe it. You hear, because they that hear shall live. You're, you're willingly hearing it. You're, you're believing it. Because... There, and I wish I'd looked this up. This is a place where, um, where somebody's telling somebody something, and they, they, they said they wouldn't hear him. Okay? Well, did they not hear him physically? No, it just means they didn't hear him. They didn't agree with him. They didn't uh, believe him. Okay? So, hear can also mean believe. Because there's different places in the Bible where it says they didn't hear them. It doesn't mean that they didn't physically hear a sound. It just means they didn't listen to them. They didn't, you know, um, allow them to, to explain things to them. They didn't agree with it. They didn't believe it. Okay. Um, so they, they that hear shall live. Verse 26. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. So, Some religions, including ones that call themselves Christians, you know, they'll basically um, say, you know, Jesus was a prophet, but not that he was the son of God, right? And that he didn't really, you know, in that case, he wouldn't have any more authority than any other prophet or any other messenger. But here it's saying that God has given him the authority. He's given him authority to execute judgment because he's son of man. Marvel not at this. Mar marvel, remember, means don't wonder, don't be amazed. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. 
Okay, the, the people in the dreams can hear his voice. Okay, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So there's two different resurrections. Was Christ was the first fruits, and we have the first resurrection and the second res res resurrection. Uh, Revelation 20 verse 4. You, you can turn the video. You can keep your finger in John 5. Revelation 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. These are people that were in the tribulation, they did, but they didn't accept it. They didn't take his image and take to be smart, and they didn't worship him, okay? And it says, They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, but the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So this is the first resurrection that anybody gets to actually get risen from the dead and stay alive, okay? That... This is the first resurrection that actually happens. Like all the people that the prophets wrote, uh, made to rise from the, the dead, the ones that Jesus did, the ones that, that you know wrote, the saints that rose at his death, those people all died again. This first resurrection is the only resurrection besides Jesus Christ that where people rose from the dead and never died again. So, and the Bible calls this the first resurrection. And notice, it's talking about people that went through the tribulation. I don't know how these pre-tribulation dispensationalists can believe in a pre-trib rapture because you can see that these people were rescued from after the tribulation. Verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with Him a thousand years. And, um, let's see here. and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed of his prison. And it, it, it talks about uh, Satan deceiving people. And verse eleven: I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Okay? So this is the second resurrection. This is the re resurrection of mainly, or mostly dead people, because it's spiritually dead, but also at this time, the people that had got saved after the rapture and had died, those people would also get resurrected. So there's two resurrections, two separate times. I think that confuses people because when it says the dead are going to be judged according to their works, that means the spiritually dead. Those that are saved, you don't get judged according to their works as far as hell or heaven. Our works are judged as far as in what kind of rewards we'll get, but not as far as heaven and hell. Let's go back to John 5, verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. So these oneness models, I don't know how they can interpret this verse. Because there's two different wills. Okay? Jesus is saying he's not seeking his own will. He's not trying to seek what, what he wants. He wants to seek what God the Father wants. And there's two separate wills. It's so, so clear to see. Verse 31. But bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Okay? So he's, he's saying, of myself, it means he's not the one that's coming up with what he's saying when he's bearing witness of himself. Because it, he's saying, if somebody bears witness of himself, their witness is not true. Okay? But bear witness of myself, my witness is not true, he's saying. So Jesus didn't do that. He, didn't, he was speaking the words that God wanted him to, to speak. There is another that bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. He sent unto John, he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. Remember, the whole book of John is written that people could get saved. Over and over again, like 
just like last week with the woman at the well. And it's just a recurring theme, right? John is a book that was written so that people could get saved. But in verse 35, he was a burning and shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness to me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness to me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. He's saying, you don't have God's word abiding in you. Why? Because you didn't believe who he had sent. If you don't believe on the person that God the Father sent, you don't have his word abiding in you. You, just, you don't... You don't have the word of God in you. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. So they thought they have eternal life, but they didn't. And they are they which testify of me. Remember, the New Testament wouldn't have been things that people would have read. It was only penned down after Jesus rose from the dead. So you see, search the scriptures. Like, look at the, the, the scriptures. Look, would have been the Old Testament at that time. Because he's saying they testify of Jesus. They, they talk about Jesus. So every single book of the Bible talks about Jesus. Every single one. Even if it doesn't mention his name. Because of course the name Jesus wasn't mentioned. Okay, we talk, you know, Messiah might be mentioned. But the word Jesus, the name Jesus wasn't mentioned. So he's admonishing them to search the scriptures. And you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. The Jews will receive the Antichrist. He's going to come in his own name, and they're going to receive him. It's like, oh, this is the promised Messiah. There'll be somebody that's trying to take the place of Jesus, some Antichrist. They're going to receive him. How can you believe? Which receive honor one of another and seek not honor that comes from God only. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So Moses wrote of Jesus. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? In Acts 10, 43, it says, To him give all the prophets witness, prophets witness, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. It says, all the prophets, all of them, not except for Joel, or except for Haggai, or, no, all of them, Habakkuk, everybody, they um, give witness. And not only do they give witness of some coming Messiah, but that through his name, whoever believes in him will have their sins forgiven. So it's not just that there's coming a redeemer, there's coming somebody to turn ungodliness away from Jacob. There's not just that. It's that he's actually going to, that through believing in his name, you'll get uh, remission of sins. So looking at verse 44, it says, How can you believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God. And this, this reminds me of Romans 10. Okay, Romans 10, 2 4. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. This is Paul talking with the Jews. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. So the Jews are ignorant of God's righteousness. And going about to establish their own righteousness. So they're ignorant of God's righteousness. If they just acknowledge that, and accept that, but no, they have to establish their own righteousness. Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believe. And John 5, 44 says, how can you believe? How, how can you even believe? Which receive honor one of another. They're, they're trying to do it themselves. They're trying to be righteous and get honor from 
from the other Pharisee, from, from the other Jew. Instead of just submitting themselves onto the righteousness of God and believing on who he sent, that they could be saved, no, nope, i got to do it myself, right? i got to receive honor of the next person because I'm doing because I'm good. Okay? But sometimes when we ask the question, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Yeah, why? Because uh, I'm a good person? You know, the Bible says there's none good. And it's it just over and over again, you know, but if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? The Jews do not believe the Old Testament. They don't believe the Torah. They don't believe anything from the Bible. Because if they believe Moses, Moses wrote of Jesus Christ. And they pretend they do, but they don't. They believe this ba Babylonian Talmud. And it's sad. It's not that I hate, hate the Jews. I hate the, the people that teach this Jew. Judaism, but I, I would wish the Jews could get saved, just like anybody else that has a false religion, even a false Christianity. I wish, you know, a lot of people could get saved. But it just irks me when, when people want to pretend that the Jews believe Old Testament because they, they don't. They don't believe any part of the Bible. So the Sabbath is a picture of Jesus' salvation, that he did all the work, we don't have to do any part of the work, and that's why in the Old Testament already they're keeping the Sabbath. Again, all the prophets give witness that believing on his name, you'll receive remission of sin. So let's pray.